Hello everybody, my name is Kara, and today I am here with a weird kind of recommendations video. Sometimes I run into books that I really really love and that I want to recommend to people, but I can't really explain them, or maybe I can explain them, I can describe the plot and the characters or the writing, and I can give you these concrete reasons why I enjoyed the book, but one of the most important features is just like the vibe or the feeling or the atmosphere and that's kind of what I'm trying to communicate to you guys it's like if you're in the mood for this particular like feeling or vibe then I think you would enjoy this book and then I started thinking about how that's very similar to how we view artwork like you can talk about the color palette and the brush strokes and the subject of the painting but one of the most important things is like looking at a picture or looking at a sculpture or whatever and the way it makes you feel or like the emotional response it has because it's such a visceral experience. So I decided to like put those two things together. Today I'm going to be pairing pieces of artwork with books. And if this experiment just kind of doesn't work for you, like if you don't really get the feelings from the paintings or if my explanations don't really make sense to you, that's totally fine. You still got some great books to check out. By the way, I am not an art student. I am not trained in any way. I just like books and I like paintings, and I decided to put them together. So the artist whose works I'm going to be describing and using today is John William Waterhouse. He was a painter during the late 1800s and early 1900s, and he was one of the capital R Romantics. He painted figures and scenes from poetry, from plays, from history, from mythology, from epic poems, from the Bible. He did a lot of different kinds of work. And one of the things that I really enjoy about his work is that he painted really complex and interesting women. Sometimes it seems like a lot of the artists, like a lot of his contemporaries at the time, pretty much just used women as attractive like set dressing for the painting, like for the setting or, you know, maybe they did use the female as the main character but she was primarily there for eye candy. And in John William Waterhouse's works, even though most if not all of the women are still very attractive, I feel like they were still allowed to have stronger expressions. They were allowed to be angry or frightening or powerful, like they were allowed to have interesting emotions in addition to being beautiful and to kind of fitting into this ideal painted version of themselves. So I tried to pick a mix of books here, like kind of different genres and different styles, and a couple of them are ones that I have talked about before, but a couple of them are ones that I haven't really featured on my channel. The first painting I want to talk about is Pandora. It was painted during either 1896 or 1898. I kind of did the best I could with the dates because some of them are a little tricky to pin down. And the book that I kind of equate with this painting, or with the feeling this painting gives me, is Deathless by Catherine M. Valente. Here's the cover so you can see it a little better. Everyone kind of knows the story of Pandora, she opened the box when she wasn't supposed to and she basically brought misery down upon the whole human race. But something that I find really interesting about Deathless and about this painting of like the story of Pandora is that there's this discussion of responsibility and free will and choice and like in the original Pandora myth she was given a, like a burning curiosity by the gods. They gave that to her on purpose because they kind of wanted this to happen or they wanted to see if this would happen. So that kind of, to me, that brings up this question of whether or not Pandora is completely to blame for what she did. You know, people kind of use her as the scapegoat for bringing like destruction and misery on the world, but if somebody caused that to happen, is it really, is it really all her fault? And the reason that kind of reminds me of Deathless is something I loved about this book so much is that all of the characters are making decisions that even if you don't agree with, you can kind of understand why they're doing them. Even even if you see them doing something, you're like, this is a mistake, this is a disaster, like, don't do it, don't open the box. Even though they make decisions that you know are mistakes, you, in that moment, you agree with them or you, you feel that same need to do something that they do. And I find that really impressive because one of the most frustrating things for me when I read a book is when a character does something that is obviously going to cause problems down the line and it's like they didn't even they didn't even stop to consider the consequences and in Deathless that doesn't really happen like even if they're doing things that I think are stupid I'm like well I don't really see what choice you had or like given your character and given the situation you're in I get it and then another thing I love about this painting that I also really enjoyed about Deathless is like the setting. So this really dark forest that you can see in the background, it's really shadowy and it's beautiful but it's a little bit frightening. And there are one or two settings in, in the novel in particular that really gave me that feeling. It's like very old world fairy tale, like these are not... These are not happily ever after kinds of stories, but you'd still go into the woods anyway. That's kind of the feeling I get. And that's another reason why I think this painting is a good representation of the weird spooky fairy tale atmosphere that I got from the book. 
The next painting I want to talk about is Cleopatra, and this was painted in 1887. Now this is probably one of my favorite images I have ever seen. I like to refer to this expression or this look as the I could crush you beneath my feet and you would thank me for it look. That's kind of what I what I think of this expression as. And the book that I think, and the, specifically the character that I think really works with that, is The Queen of Atolia by Megan Whalen Turner. This is the second book in the Queen's Thief series, and the title character is just so wonderful. She's very similar to Cleopatra in my opinion because she's this brilliant strategist, this incredibly complex woman who a lot of people around her kind of write her off as a figurehead or as just this beautiful woman who somehow got where she is even though she doesn't have any of her own skills or value. Just like this whole feeling I get of like feminine power and with the the value of feminine things is just really important to me. I love seeing that represented in books. I get really sick of seeing women who like wearing dresses or who enjoy like makeup or who like traditionally feminine hobbies, I get really really tired of seeing them vilified or criticized by the other characters in the book. Or even sometimes it seems like by the authors. So something that I really loved about the Queen of Atolia is that she uses all of it. It's somewhat unusual for a woman to be in the position that she is and she's fine with that. And it's also unusual for a woman to be comfortable with that and with being really like kind of what we would call girly and I also really loved that. So a quick note about the series is I have seen a lot of people say that you don't have to read the first book. I think the first book is just called The Thief, that you can just go right to this one. And you probably could. I read the first book before reading the second one so I can't say definitively if you would be confused or not, but I think that some of the things that happen in this book, like the way the story unfolds and revelations about characters and things like that, I don't think they would have meant nearly as much if I hadn't started with the first book and gotten kind of the background of the world and sort of formed these opinions about other characters or other things in the books. So I would really recommend starting with the first one, but if you start it and you're like, I don't like this at all, like I'm not going to read the series, then just skip it and go to the second one because it feels very different in tone to the first one and this is just such a fantastic book. I need to continue the series soon, but I'm kind of savoring it. The next painting is one a little bit lighter in tone, and that is called The Toilette, and it was painted in 1889. So in comparison to the last couple, and actually to a lot of John William Waterhouse's other paintings, this one is a lot brighter, it's a lot more peaceful looking, and the book that I kind of get this feeling from is I Capture the Castle by Dodie Smith. It's kind of a perfect book to talk about in this video because one of the things that I love about it so much is also the hardest to explain and that's like the feeling like kind of the mix of like comfort and melancholy and also like sweetness that I get from this book and that's also what I get from this painting. So we have these two women who are kind of like getting ready and bonding or you know spending time together. I think of them as two sisters which is also perfect for I Capture the Castle because it is primarily about a family with two sisters and how they kind of react when a family of Americans moves into their kind of countryside area, this is set in England, and the eldest daughter becomes determined to marry one of these American men in order to save their house or castle that they live in from basically descending into ruin because they live in very genteel poverty at this point. And it is like a very light and comedic and engaging novel. I feel like the tone of it is very like sweet and charming without being overly so, but there are some kind of like darker moments or darker undercurrents in the story that I think are also really interesting. So getting into symbolism here, like as you can see in the background of the painting, there's some plant life that is sort of like taking over the like garden area. Like there's like this very meticulously laid out garden and then there's all this like greenery and it's almost a little bit wild looking and that's kind of how I feel about I Capture the Castle is it's got this like veneer of civility and of like very civilized comedy and that kind of like British classic feeling. But underneath that there are some darker things going on. Like the family, the main character and her family are afraid they're going to lose their house at some point. And there are also some darker elements with the relationships themselves, with like the desperation of of her older sister Rose. And from her perspective, she needs to marry somebody in order to save her family. I think that really brings out the other aspects of the novel is having that light and charming atmosphere kind of contrasted with the darker aspects of the book as well. I think it makes both halves of it feel more real because they are like kind of put next to the other one. It's not making any sense at all. There's also a pivotal scene in the novel that takes place in kind of a uh, garden greenhouse kind of area 
and that's that also is what I'm reminded of when I look at this picture too. And finally, the last painting book combo I'm going to talk about today starts with The Beautiful Lady Without Pity, and this was painted in 1893. It is also known by its French name, which I am about to hopelessly mispronounce, and that is La Belle Dame Sans Merci. And the novel I'm going to talk about is one that I have mentioned kind of briefly on my channel, and that is My Cousin Rachel by Daphne du Maurier. Daphne du Maurier is, of course, known more for her novel Rebecca, but I enjoyed My Cousin Rachel even more than Rebecca, I think. And I feel like it's a little bit underappreciated when put next to some of her more famous works. I think it is becoming more known now because of the new movie that just came out, but I think this is just such a fantastic novel. And I feel like it really perfectly fits the kind of symbolism and the like depictions in this painting. So the beautiful lady without pity is death. That's kind of important to know going in. So as you can see in the painting, there is the beautiful woman, or death, and there is a knight who is kind of ensnared by her. And if you look closely, she's actually got him wrapped in her hair. Like she's literally ensnared him with this symbol of feminine beauty, like with her hair. And that is such a good <laughs> representation of the character Rachel from the novel. But something that's so interesting about the novel is, is seeing the very different ways that it's possible to interpret her character, to interpret Rachel. Because is she, is she using her beauty and perceived helplessness to like ensnare like helpless men? Or is she like the victim here and she's just, she's, she's looking for someone to rescue her? Like there are so many ways to interpret her and even after reading the novel it's like I, I have so many mixed feelings I'm not exactly sure what I think happened and it's so interesting to go and read reviews for this book after you finished it because there are some people that are just like so convinced of this one thing and there are some people that just are like me and have like no idea what really happened but they loved it anyway. I just think that's so encapsulated in this in this painting and another thing I want to point out is that the male figure in the painting is a literal knight in shining armor and that is very appropriate for the novel as well because part of what I think gets Philip into trouble is this need he has to protect someone whether or not they actually need it or want it and kind of how that misleads him into certain situations and how it makes him misjudge people. I think that's such a good metaphor for like his need to like protect what he perceives as this like helpless beautiful woman and whether or not that's actually the case is a different story. Okay everybody so that is all I have for this video. I don't know how this is going to turn out. I had a lot of fun doing it. I think it's a really cool way to talk about books that, you know, their, their central like thing that drew you to them or that made you enjoy them is something that is a little hard to communicate to people in words. So that's why I did paintings, you know, worth a thousand words. Please let me know if you guys have read any of these books, what you thought of them, or if you're planning to pick any of them up. I will see you soon with another video, and I hope you love the next book you read. Bye!